Clear prop. Star 73, Cherokee number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's stuff to do. One Charlie Bravo makes for it in runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm great. This week, uh, we are going to dive into another request from a listener. Uh, thank you very much to Corey McLean for giving us this idea. Uh, and it's all about proper radio techniques. Um, I'm sure during all your check rides, Wally, you have heard some crazy stuff. But uh, I, I, give me an idea. Give the listeners an idea. Like how much bad radio technique do you see? There's, there's a lot of improper radio technique i think at the end of the day the the reason we talk on the radio is to communicate and so we want effective communication um and can can we communicate effectively using um maybe improper techniques we we can so there's there's kind of three levels of of communicating the way i look at it uh the 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 top level the 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 one that we all want to strive for, I would think, is that we use um, proper terminology and we we communicate effectively. Um, the the I'm going to skip to the absolute uh, the, the number three um, scenario, which is where we don't want to be is improper technique and, and ineffective communication. Um, and then somewhere in the middle is maybe improper technique, but still effective communication. I mean, I guess if you uh, were in a, an unfortunate situation in an airplane and, and, and you screamed and yelled that you were on fire, uh, maybe the controller may understand your predicament and um, provide the necessary help um, where, you know, obviously there's a better way to do that um, rather than screaming over the radio. Uh, which I've never heard, by the way. Um, but uh, as, as what I see as an observer, and that's what I am as an examiner in an airplane, I'm an observer. I'm not a crew member. I, I am uh, I'm not really even a pilot. Um, I'm just observing the check ride and, and making an evaluation. I see a lot of, of applicants um, speaking to air traffic control and um, – as I'm sitting back, I'm thinking, well, they, they've said something, but I don't think ATC really um, understood what that person is saying. And, uh, and you need to, you know, as a pilot, we need to pick up on the fact that maybe uh, ATC didn't really understand what I was getting at or they didn't understand my request. Um, one example I always give to applicants when we're talking about this, I say, okay, if we're sitting in this briefing room and I tell you that there's a bomb under, under the table and it's going to explode in 60 seconds, uh, I would expect the reaction out of you. I would expect you to maybe get up and run out of the room and I'd be right behind you. Um, but a lot of times we will um, say things to ATC and ATC will will respond, um, but ATC maybe didn't really get it. Sometimes we have to read between the lines. So the, I think the most important thing is effective communication, and there's all kinds of accident cases where there was not effective communication, where you, after the fact, uh, we had an uh, accident here in Houston a couple years ago with a, uh airplane um, running very low on fuel down at uh, Hobby Airport, and um, again, after the fact, we all listened to it, and, and everybody's saying, "How how could the controller not hear in the voice of of this pilot that they were running out of fuel?" Well, the the, the pilot never really said they were running out of fuel. So, bottom line is effective communication, and that's what we're we're trying to affect here um, is is communicating effectively between the pilot and the controller. Yeah, and, th- and I think when we get the request online to, to talk about proper radio techniques, there's there's a, that that could be it could be many many shows, but we're going to try and take some of what Wally sees and some of what I see around the fly school every day, and share some techniques that will make you better on your communications, 
uh, and give you some best practices to use. So we're going to kind of talk about some guidance at a high level, uh, and then we're going to share some best practices, and then we'll wrap it up. And we're not just taking this from experience. That There is a very crisp there's Chris guidance on how to use the radio, right? So we're going to reference a section of the aim, which is the aeronautical information manual. If you, if you, if you talk about or heard of the far aim, there are really two books. I think when I was a student pilot, maybe even a private pilot, maybe even an instrument pilot, I thought the far aim was one book. Wally don't, well, I guess I just told everybody. So everybody yeah. knows, yeah. but I thought it was one book, but it's really two books. The aim is the back and it, it's a really good collection of information i think it's underutilized but in the far in the aim section 4-2-1 it talks about radio communications phraseology and techniques it's only six pages so this podcast is going to reference almost all six pages we're going to talk about those items um, and we'll give you some other things to think about and look at as well but let's talk about the commonalities that we see, Wally, and and the first one, like you said, it's effective communication. The AIM talks about the single most important thought in a pilot controller communications is that they both understand each other. And we train foreign students here. I know I say things to those guys and girls that they don't understand because I grew up here and I have a different slang and they understand English, but they don't understand some of my jokes or my slang things right and i think we could we could reference some stories where that has happened on the radio as well um and you talked about screaming maybe not the most effective but i'm sure the controller would understand um but there is some phraseology that will help with the communication and the understanding um i think the first thing we all learn maybe second third lesson is how to call up ground at this airport for sure. Uncontrolled airports are a little different, but call up the airport, call up ground, tell them that I'm going to taxi and I'm going to go somewhere. There's a there's a technique that we all use for that, right? That we're gonna we're gonna tell we're gonna tell the people we're calling we're calling them. So we would say hooks ground at this airport. We want to tell them who we are and what our intent is, right? Every time we use the radio. So right. at this airport for me, it would be hooks ground. November 919 Tango Charlie, uh, I'm ready to taxi. I have information, Zulu, I need a run up and I'm going to depart to the West. Something to that effect. Now, we were talking before we started recording is the tail number the right thing to do? So let's talk about that initial call up, break it down for the listeners and kind of give them some best practices around that. Yeah, the, the initial call up, um, uh, if, if you look in, in this section in the aim, and again, the aim is non-regulatory in in nature so uh, you could say the aim is is sort of best practices and uh, man there's a lot of good stuff in the in in the aim um, a lot of uh, a lot of techniques and uh, but anyway uh, the one thing it, it does talk about in aircraft call signs and I'm I'm just reading I'm reading uh, a, a paragraph here it says Civil aircraft pilots should state the aircraft type, model, or manufacturer's name, followed by the digits, letters of the registration number. When the aircraft's manufacturer's name or model is stated, the prefix N is dropped. Uh, And an example is Aztec 2464 Alpha. So what we seem to have here at, at this airport, and again, I work very closely with several flight schools here, is most people want to call up uh, November one two three Alpha Charlie, and basically um, by using the term November, you're telling the controller that you are, are a reg- U.S. registered airplane, which really doesn't tell them a whole lot. There's two hundred twelve thousand U.S. registered airplanes, so you're one of two hundred twelve thousand airplanes. You could be a an experimental, uh, you could be a Learjet, you could be a helicopter, uh, who knows what you are. So what, what the aim wants to do and, and what it suggests is that you tell it what kind of airplane you are. Now, could you say Cessna 123 Alpha Charlie? Absolutely. Um, and that, that meets the, requ- the uh, request of, of this paragraph in the aim. 
Do you tell ATC more if you say Skyhawk, one, two, three, Alpha Charlie? You do, because now he knows you're a Skyhawk. You're a Cessna 172. You do about 100 knots. Your speed is compatible with a Warrior. Uh, your speed is not compatible with a Beechcraft Baron. Um, so I think you tell him a whole lot more information. I'll give, give an example. Just on a check ride the other day, we were... Uh, in a situation where we were going into a controlled airport and um, the applicant uh, just used his his number and his uh, and, and November. So he says, uh, November, we're one, two, three, Alpha Charlie, we're 10 miles east inbound for landing. And the controller gave us a squawk code and he told us what to do on our left downwind for runway whatever. And uh, we were we happened to be in a warrior, a Piper warrior. And uh, the controller made an assumption, um, and I don't know where he got this, but he assumed that we were a Cessna. And so uh, as we were entering the downwind, he pointed us out to another aircraft. He says, you're following a Cessna on a left downwind. And, um, and uh, we had to get on the radio and say, no, we're not a Cessna. We are a warrior. We're, we're a low-wing airplane. Um, so you just alleviate all that. You, you hear this at control at uncontrolled airports as well. Um, you know, if you're at an uncontrolled airport and you hear someone calling out their call sign, November one, two, three, Alpha Charlie on a left downwind for a runway one seven, um, you look up, you see an airplane on a left downwind. Well, you assume that's one, two, three, Alpha Charlie. But if you say super cub one, two, three, Alpha Charlie, Oh gee, I know what I'm looking for. I know exactly what the, what what the airplane should look like now could it be confusing could there be two cessnas in the pattern yeah could there be two warriors but but you give more information and in fact you go to a lot of airports and if you just give the november one two three alpha charlie first thing the controller is going to come back and say state your type aircraft uh we're spoiled a little bit at this airport because i think all the controllers they, they know most of the airplanes. They know where the airplanes live, that this airplane belongs to this flight school, this airplane parks on this side of the field. So um, they, they give our, our pilots here a little bit of uh, wiggle room, which you go to other airports, and that's not going to happen. No, all, all good thoughts for the private or the instrument-rated student who's out there flying around um, on, on what they should do. Now, I like to say that I'm a like sky lane heavy. That's my, you know, tip or trick for myself. Yeah. Big, big bird in the air. I'm just kidding. But the thought process is there are a lot of different types of Cessna aircraft out there. So right. you should. Uh, and when I fly the one, a two, I try to start with sky lane. That does give them information. I could be overtaking people. Um, they, they, they at least know that we're not two one seventy twos that are in the pattern, et cetera. Right. So, uh, all good stuff. What about the, the read back? phraseology you know what should we read back i fly with people on a regular basis and we do fly following and the you know i get handed off to the next the next controller and they always respond you know i i, I read off skylane 149 or two uniform i'm with you 5,500 feet and that and they say 149 or two uniform thanks uh the college station altimeter is 2992 what am i supposed to say at that point yeah, really, at that point, um, you know, all you need to do is acknowledge it. Um, uh, most people will read back the altimeter. Um, it's probably wasted breath. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt anything. Um, the fact of the matter is that the once the controller gives you that in information, they've probably mentally checked out to an extent um so even if you read back the wrong altimeter i'm not sure they're going to catch it yeah um so i'm not sure what what good that does um you know what you need to read back to the controller is is clearances cleared to uh you know a given altitude yeah we'll read back that number um but um, I, I hear uh, applicants all the time reading back the weather okay uh Sky clear, Windsor calm, altimeter two nine nine two, and they're they're reading back the weather. Um, really, really not necessary. Now, if you've got a question about that, uh, you you know you you you're, you're questioning the winds. Confirm the winds. 
uh, winds are calm. Okay. Uh, you, you know, you'll get something like that back from the controller, but, um, you know, I, I, I kind of call it economy of speaking. Sometimes, um, sometimes we speak a little bit too much on the radio and, uh, uh, again, I, you know, sometimes I, I, I joke, I'll, I'll say some, somebody talked a lot, but they didn't say much. Mm. And, um, so I think, I think we can over talk on the radio. And there is guidance for this in the aim as well, right? right. So four dash four dash seven talks really about that, that the pilot should read back parts of the instructions, including altitude assignments, vectors, or runways. And that, that might sound like common sense, but it should be done also with your tail number so that they don't get confused or the other people that are trying to create some situational awareness listening kind of know where you're at and where you're planning on going both in the on the ground and in the air for sure so readbacks are pretty important but we don't have to read back everything they say we right. need to read back the pertinent information specifically clearances and those numbers that provide a lot of information and then we talked a little bit about the en route stuff like i do think people are confused on what all should i say while i'm en route um uh, regarding altitudes and those sorts of things. But I, I think it's kind of the same stuff. It's who you're calling, your call sign, it, aircraft information, and then uh, relevant information as it relates to your 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 flight level, even though it might be 6,500. Or um, if you have a, a request or your intentions, if there are any of those as well. Right. So there's another tool that we'll put in the show notes of this podcast that you can find a lot of information out. Uh, I almost call it a set of cheat sheet information on phraseology, and it's called the Pilot Controller Glossary, um, and it's it's on the FAA's website. It's not a huge document, but provides a lot of information. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll throw another thing out that I don't think I'm good at. I think sometimes I say Roger when I probably shouldn't say Roger. Like maybe right. I should have used Wilco. Um, there's a lot of those things that are in the pilot controller glossary that I think would benefit everyone to yeah. use, uh, to, to read and then use that stuff correctly. Because uh, when people use Wilco, I'm like, oh, that sounds cool, man. Yeah. You know, they yeah. say Wilco, and I'm like, yeah. they got everything. You know, they, right. they told the controller everything the controller ever needed to know. Right. And I just don't always use Wilco. Right. And then sometimes I'll say, Roger that. And I feel like I'm a, a captain of an airliner, but I'm saying the wrong stuff, right? Yeah. Um, affirmative means yes, negative means no. Um, Roger means I received your last transmission while Wilco says I received it and will do exactly what you said. Right, right. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll talk a lot more about it, but I think it's a really good time that we should talk about unable, right? Like it's a very useful word for any pilot yeah. and something that I think controllers would tell us. Uh, I work with some cl controllers pretty close. They would tell us that it's not going to hurt their feelings if we say unable. And if you need to say it, you really should say it. Right, right. And, and let me just go back to what we were just you were just talking about a little bit. Um, I see a lot of confusion between Roger and affirmative. And, and Roger, as you said, Roger just means that you've received what they said. Uh, aff affirmative means yes. So uh, I'll hear um, uh, Cessna or Skyhawk one, two, three, traffic, 12 o'clock, three miles, same altitude. Um, and they'll, they'll, do you have it in sight? And uh, the the applicant will see the airplane and they'll say, uh, Roger. And that, that doesn't really say anything. So what you want to say is affirmative. We do have the traffic in sight. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, one phrase that has been creeping in the vocabulary of pilots that I've began to hear just really in the last six to eight weeks is I have eyes on the traffic. Um, and, and I, I think that's a police thing. I think, I think, uh, I think I've heard it on TV. I have eyes on the suspect and, um, I've actually heard controllers question the pilot, um, saying, uh, you know, what, what? And, and, uh, they'll say, I, I have eyes on the traffic now. Can it be effective communication? Yeah, I think it can, but that's really, um, 
that's not an aviation phrase. You know, the, the best thing we would want to say would be traffic is in sight. Another thing that I th- I know one of my assistant chiefs who works at Houston Center uh, in, at ATC, he would say similar to that uh, phrases like no joy, you know, come out. Uh, and it's I think it's pilots trying to be cute or sound like they're super right. pilots, maybe. Right. Um, I got him on the box. Yeah. It's real common. Yeah. Like, what kind of box do you have? Is yeah. your box a big box or a little box? Yeah. Um, or one that I think is continuously growing, and I've probably been at fault to say this, is I have them on ADSB, right. which probably means I've got four flight and I've got a ADSB in receiver. And so I'm, I see a plane on my screen. But that's not what, especially under VFR conditions, that's not what a controller wants to know. Right. They want to know, do you really have visual contact with that aircraft? Right. Um, and so lots of slang, lots of lots of things that aren't in the glossary that we, sh- that we hear often that you guys and girls should not be using uh, when you're talking to ATC for sure. Another thing that, that I find interesting that's in the AIM that I've been asked about and as a flight school owner – is pretty near and dear to my heart uh, is the section 4-2-4 C as in Charlie. And that is the student pilot. Uh, And I think it's something that we should all encourage student pilots to use. Um, Wally, I asked you your thoughts earlier, but let's, let's tell the whole world what you think. What are your thoughts on this section and, and the use of it? I can honestly say when I was a student pilot, I never uh, complied with this. Um, basically, it, it it says that on your first uh, call up to ATC that you should identify yourself as a student pilot. And the more I think about this, uh, the more I'm on board with this. I mean, it is it is in the aim, and again, aim non regulatory in nature. So, do you have to comply with this? No, but is this best practices? Yeah, it is absolutely. So, I think it raises the awareness. Well, it definitely raises the awareness of the the controller um, that um, uh, it's a student pilot. Um, there are certain phrases that. Um, uh, a lot of times on a check ride, uh, maybe a private pilot check ride, we're uh, trying to get out from underneath the Bravo airspace, and we we level off at a at an intermediate altitude, and the the applicant uh, automatically pulls the power back to um, two thousand RPM, and we're puddling along at uh, eighty five knots, and uh, you know I got somewhere to be or or we want to kind of expedite the check ride and i will say maintain best forward airspeed and uh a lot of times they they've never heard that phrase and i think with a controller if you identify yourself as a student pilot and if he were to give you something like that uh maintain best forward airspeed and you uh, um maybe um came back to him with um say again or 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 you know alluded to you don't understand what he means i think he's going to be more in tune to um your situation that um you're a student pilot and and hopefully he he would uh say disregard and uh you know give you a little bit more more uh space to operate in the the aim specifically calls out that they give you extra assistance and consideration and i think i think any controller that's working in Houston probably has some experience and they know that a student pilot probably needs a little bit more time, a little bit more clarity and a little bit slower talking. I mean, Texans can talk fast either way, whether you're a controller or not. And some, some controllers really talk fast. So I think it's a huge benefit for my students that are either in the pattern or going on their first long cross country to just identify themselves as a student pilot and, and hopefully ATC's handing that information off as they transverse different control centers as well. It, it can only help. And don't we, don't we, we just did first solo a few, few weeks ago back. Don't we want them to all to be as successful as they can be? I mean, we want to give them every benefit that they got. And this is one benefit that's there to use. You might as well use it for sure. Absolutely. So you just said, say again, I know that we've talked a little bit about this off the air. Um, why not? Why not say repeat that? 
Yeah, you you uh, you know, there's a couple of, of phrases that um, that I hear um, a lot on check rides, and um, and you know, if the controller gives an instruction or a clearance, and you you want them to, um, you, know, you didn't get it. You you need uh, you need to hear it again. You know, the proper phrase is say again. I hear a lot of a lot of students say repeat. And in 99% of the time, the controller repeats it, and they they understand it. Um, what we have to understand, and and what I try to get a feeling for with my applicants is where they want to go with their flying career. And I may treat the check rides a little bit differently, come at them from a little bit different angles, depending on the objective of the applicant. Um, I mean, obviously, we're still going to. Uh, adhere to the ACS and, and all that, that good stuff. But, um, you know, a lot of, if you're going to fly professionally, you're going to fly out of the country and you may be talking to a controller whose native language is not English and their, their command of the English language is, is maybe not that good. Um, so, um, we want to stick with the, the proper, uh, phraseology and um you know say again is what we want to say to to have something repeated so um it 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 is less confusing to the controller if you can use uh the proper the proper phrase and um especially you know over the middle of south america in the middle of the night when you're talking to a controller whose native language is portuguese or spanish um, you, you know, you don't, you don't want any area for confusion. Yeah. And I, I probably don't use that. Um, I probably say repeat or something. Um, so I'll, I will incorporate say again in the future and be a better, be a better pilot or communicator because of it. So let's jump into some best practices and we've, we've got a list of seven, eight, nine things we want to share with everybody, uh, before we wrap up. So this is a big one. It, it's talked about a lot. I don't think we all do it enough, and I think the better, the longer you get in the in the pilot seat, the worse you get at this probably. But it's listen before you transmit, right? We we change channels a lot. We go from practice area to tower to maybe the the ATC that's going to help us shoot a practice approach or something like that. When we switch that channel, that doesn't mean we're just because we're on that channel that it's our channel, right? We, right. we should we should listen. If you were giving guidance and, and you're obviously a professional pilot and you do a lot of GA work, how long should someone listen before they communicate? I would say, uh, three to five seconds. Um, the thing is a lot of times your controller, um, is listening to multiple frequencies. Um, and so he may be getting an earful from another frequency and you don't hear it. Um, and so, you know, switch the frequency, give it at three to five seconds. And then at that point, uh, check in Houston Center, Skyhawk 123 Alpha Charlie 6500. And, uh, you know, give them a few minutes, or I shouldn't say a few minutes, a few seconds. Um, most of the time, he's going to come right back to you and say, 123 Alpha Charlie, uh, Roger, radar contact. College Station Altimeter two nine or nine or two, um, you know if if you don't hear from them in maybe twenty thirty seconds, um, maybe give it another call. Um, you know, and one reason we like to have uh, you know most of the radios have a a standby and a um, uh, active frequency. You know, it's nice to have the old frequency there. So if you make two, three, four radio calls to them and you don't hear from them, um, you can just push the button, go back to the old frequency. And, uh, you know, this happens a lot with airlines. You just call them back and say, uh, you know, Fort Worth Center, uh, uh, that we, nobody, you know, typically what I'll say, nobody's home on one, two, three, five, seven. Okay. Try another frequency. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just, conversational etiquette you know if you're sitting at a dinner table with a bunch of people 
Um, you're not going to just jump in. You're going to wait till there's a lull in the conversation before you, um, before you start saying what you need to say. And just keep in mind that uh, the controller is probably working many airplanes. You're not the only one out there. So, um, and he may be dealing with an emergency that you don't know about. So just have patience. Just yeah, have the thing I'll add to this one is three to five seconds is a great rule of thumb if you're if you're changing being directed to change channels, et cetera. If you're flying to a non-controlled airport or you're flying back, even in this situation, I'm practicing, now I'm flying back to, to hooks and I'm 20 miles away, but I'm still in the practice area. There's no reason why I don't stay on the practice area, assuming I have two radios, and then start listening to hooks at 20 miles, knowing that I'm not going to call them until I'm 12 to 10 miles, that's probably going to be more like four minutes that I'm listening. Like, but but I can learn a lot of information. I can learn what way they're landing traffic right now. Even if I've got the weather and know that information, that could have changed. Um, I know how busy they are. I kind of get a sense of, are they? do they have six jets lined up and I'm going to have to hold out here for a while for some reason? So I like to to listen a lot longer if I'm approaching an airport or a, a, a center of area where there's a lot of aircraft. Yeah. But uh, just switching radios, I like the three to five seconds. But I would say much longer if I'm going somewhere that has a radio, I should be at least listening in on some of that stuff. Oh, definitely. And I, I, I talk to people and I say, look, um, we were given two ears and we were given one mouth. So what's more important, listening or talking? I can learn so much by listening to what – the uh, tower is given the other airplanes. If I'm going, if I'm coming back here to remain in the pattern, um, I'm probably going to get the same thing as the other airplanes in the pattern. If they got four airplanes in right traffic, um, chances are they're not going to give me left traffic. So I'm already p- expecting right traffic. Now it, it may change. It may change, and you may have to uh, adjust. But um, Already, I, I've got an idea of what's going on. I mean, the runway may be closed. Maybe they had an, uh, a, a disabled airplane on the, on the runway. Um, so, you know, wouldn't it be nice to know if I'm going to divert to another airport? Wouldn't it be nice to know 25 miles out rather than 8 miles out? No doubt. You know, I can make my, my decision now. I might be right on top of another airport that I can divert to. The next best practice is know what you're going to say. And... Uh, a close friend of mine that works at ATC said PTT does not stand. It stands for push to talk. It does not stand for push to think. And uh, seeing and hearing a lot of student pilots around here, watching a lot of people learn how to fly here, I hear a lot of button pushing and a, a long pause and a uh, hook scround. Um, I got uh, I got the weather. It's uh, um, India, and uh, you know. They, they, they're not prepared, right? So know right. what you're going to say. I, I tell people, I wrote the whole thing down every time before I taxied out as a student pilot. Um, it, it made me a better communicator, and I would say do the same thing. Other guidance that I've heard best practice-wise would be if you don't know exactly the phraseology, just use plain English. Like, yes, I'm here, I want to go there, and just talk through that like you would at a dinner table. Because right. I think sometimes people get that, that um stuckishness because they're trying to be they're trying to sound like like Maverick and they're trying to say exactly the correct pilot wordage right uh, and that's just not helping anybody right um be clear concise and precise uh we talk about this a lot right just be short say what you need to say but don't don't ramble on and on about it a good one is never assume I think this one catches a lot of people. We talk about it here a lot. When you leave the same FBO and you taxi to the same place for a run up and you kind of know the traffic patterns, if the winds are from the south, are always going to be one seven, right? You kind of get lulled into this. I'm going to go here and they're going to tell me how to get there this way. That expectation, expectation bias can really bite you. Yeah. Um, doesn't take much to, to, Turn the, the pattern around and you'd be going some somewhere completely different. So try to never assume. Slow it down is always a good one. I think students are trying to be fast too. Um, it's not too hard to just take a deep breath, write something down, slow it back down to them. Um, too often, I think, 
it's an ego maybe i don't know wally why, why do we try to sound like a, a superstar air, airline pilot when we're not i don't know i don't know that's that's a great question um uh i i think one of the thing i think radio communication is probably one of the more intimidating things for um new pilots um you you always hear them talk i i know i know my my daughters were were intimidated by it and uh i i hope that they've gotten over that um but uh uh well i know they have actually <laughs> um I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's just something that um, I think uh, it's an embarrassment. Every, every, they think everybody in the world is hearing them. They think everybody in the world is analyzing them. And, and that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, I've I've laughed at people on the radio, but and I, I joke that I'm not laughing at them. I'm laughing with them because it's probably a mistake I've made. Um, I know when I first got back into flying general aviation airplanes, um, six, seven years ago, it was all I could do to not say United before I, um, said my call sign. And so many times it was, you know, I, uh, uh, Skyhawk five, three, whatever. Um, so, um, you know, even in that case there was, you know, I was, I was a little embarrassed, but uh, people aren't laughing at you. It's, um, we all make mistakes and, and that's fine. Yeah, we talked a little bit about unable, but that's the best practice, right? Really use it. Don't be afraid to use it. Controllers aren't going to get mad at you. Um, and you are pilot in command. So if you're unable, use the word unable. Yeah. And don't take advantage of it, but use it if you need it. And and I think just listening to what the controller says, um, we, we see this a lot. We're, we're coming back in at the, the end of a check ride. And maybe we're going to do some landings here. And uh, we call up and we say... Uh, um, um, Cessna or Skyhawk one two three Alpha Charlie inbound for touch and goes with information Bravo, and uh, he may say, Roger, enter a uh, right base runway one seven right, clear to land. You know, right there is the time to clear up. Just conf- uh, you know to to let the controller know we would like to remain in the pattern. So we don't really want to be cleared to land. We want to be cleared for a touch and go or cleared for the option, uh, hopefully. So, uh, you know, try to listen to what the controller is saying. And if it's, if it's really not, um, maybe not what you're expecting or, or you think he is thinking something else, um, let them know. Uh, just the, yesterday, we took off runway 17 here at, at Hooks, 17 right, and we wanted to go to the northeast, and the controller gave us a right turnout. And um, and we can certainly turn to the northeast via a right turn off 17 right, but it's uh, definitely not the norm. And uh, I, I think in the long run, uh, and, and the, the applicant did say something to the controller once we got in the air and it was pretty obvious that the controller uh expected that we were going to the northwest when we're actually going to the northeast so we're able to clear that up and um take care of things and it it turned into a a non-event but had we just turned to the northwest or excuse me uh if we just turned to the northeast uh he may have uh been uh not too pleased with us no doubt. The the last couple is ask for help when you need it. Uh, I've never talked to an air traffic controller who said, don't bother me or I don't want to help you. They all are very service minded. They want to help pilots. They want to help us all get to where we're going to go. They want to help us if we have anything, anything possible they can help us with. I know they want to do it. There's never been a question about it. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is we learn it really early on. It's in this order for a reason. The real job of a pilot is to aviate, navigate, then communicate. While this show's about communicating, it's really more important that you aviate first, yes. navigate second, communicate third. Yes. Um, and I think every person that works in ATC would would ten times over tell a pilot to do those things in that exact order for sure. Yeah. Thanks for the show idea. Hopefully this has been a good one for everybody out there. If you have a show idea, please let us know by sending an email to Bobby or Wally, Bobby at BehindTheProp.com, Wally at BehindTheProp.com, and we will make a show out of it for you. Until next time, fly safe and stay behind the prop. 
Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe.